Hello and welcome to the next episode of the podcast. Your casual budding enthusiast thing for people who like plants. On this episode, we have the master of the microbes himself, Jeff Lowenfels, here to answer all our questions on organic gardening, good weed, and the future of the canner industry. As always, huge shout out to our sponsors, Seeds Here Now, your number one seed bank in the game, guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination, all the best breeders, go get the new Duke Diamond Drop, Figure 4, on point. Likewise, check out Radio Ridge Nurseries, your one-stop shop for all the best clones in the game, exclusive breeder cuts you can't get elsewhere, and just some great people in general. And finally, a shout out to Organic Gardening Solutions and the Patreon gang. Holding down the fort down under. We love you guys. Thank you for all the support. So, let's get into it. Alrighty, so a massive welcome to a man who simply needs no introduction, a friend of mine and the author of what many consider to be the Organic Gardener's Bible, and the man who reminded the world the importance of mycorrhizal fungi, Jeff Lowenfels. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. Thank you. I guess, you know, I got my brand new hat on here, you know, I guess maybe I could take it off so people I'm really kind of bald and <laughs> whatever. Uh, anyway, yeah, hey, thanks for having me. Uh, what fun. Uh, you know, this is an amazing technology we have. We can meet from all over the world and, you know, that's just an amazing, amazing thing. But it makes sense when you think about it because microbes are ubiquitous too. They're all over the world. So I can talk about Alaskan uh, microbes. You can talk about uh, Australian uh, microbes. Basically, we're talking about the same thing, which is amazing. I love it. I love it. The connections are there far and wide. So the first question we like to ask our guests, what have you been smoking on recently? Well, let's see. Uh, a little citrus sap. Someone someone gave me uh, just, a, just a couple of days ago. Uh, you know, when you go around and give advice to people about what to grow and how to grow things and whatnot, sometimes they... They gave you a little gift here and there, which is kind of fun. Uh, but I, I really, I've really been smoking. I don't really smoke. I, I vaporize uh, flour. I have haven't really had a combustion situation with a joint in about four or five years because I, I find it to be much more enjoyable. I think it's probably a lot healthier if you don't carbonize the the flour. But in any case, I've been doing this. You know, now that my parents are gone, I can say it. Uh, <laughs> A long, long, long time, and it's finally gotten to the point where the stigma is gone, where the uh, quality has improved, where we're not, you know, smoking or vaporizing sticks and sticks and seeds, uh, and of course, the effort to legalize all around the, the world has just been absolutely phenomenal, as you know. So uh, it's a it's a new world we're living in. Um, I think there there are a couple of rules we all need to follow, and uh, uh, some of them we are and some of them we aren't. And I think, I think we'll get there, but, uh, uh, we, we've got to prevent governments from looking at cannabis as the gateway to taxation that it has become in the United States and, uh, start treating this plant more like a tomato plant than something else. Uh, this is, this is a plant that's easy to grow that everybody can grow, Let's not treat this thing like it's a, a fourth branch of government, for goodness sakes. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm off my stool. <laughs> no, I love it. And I've definitely got some stuff up that alley I want to jump into. But let's just quickly rewind for a minute. What was your first experience with cannabis? Well, I was uh, actually uh, in, in college in, in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And uh, my brother came over to me. Uh, freshman year, he was a, a law student about to graduate, and his girlfriend, he said, had just tried to commit suicide, and he made me promise I would never, ever smoke cannabis. Of course, we called it marijuana back then, uh, and so I, I went a year while he was off in Europe getting a Fulbright scholarship, and when he came back, I was helping him unpack, and the first thing out of his suitcase was a gigantic, beautiful inlaid hash pipe that he picked up in Morocco. And I said, what's this? He said, oh, oh, well, you can buy a can of hash for $5 in Morocco. And I went, what? You made me not smoke can marijuana for a year? 
that was that was it. So I went back to college. <laughs> uh, one of one of my great friends uh, and I we just we just got stoned, and I haven't looked back since. Fantastic. So when let's fast forward a little bit. When was it that you grew your first plant? Well, let's see. I probably first got stoned about nineteen. 19- 67, 68, probably about 1975. I I was in law school at the time. And and one of my law professors had a bunch of plants that had uh, uh, mealybugs on them. And uh, she knew I was a gardener. She said, can you do anything with them? I said, I I don't know about, you you know, give them to me and I'll try. (laughs) And I did. Uh, So the alcohol took care of both me and the mealybugs on the plants, and we, we did just fine. <laughs> Fantastic. So what was it ultimately that kind of stimulated you to write Teeming with Microbes? Well, I've always been a gardener, and uh, I've been uh, – I mean, in fact, they tell me I am the longest r- running garden columnist in the world. I've been writing a garden column in Anchorage, Alaska since 1976. Every single week, I never miss a single week because they put your picture in the paper and they say he's not there. Uh, <laughs> he'll be back in a couple of weeks. And to me, that always said rob his house. So I always have a column. And um, I, you know, I, I wasn't writing for cannabis. I was writing for people in Anchorage, Alaska, a place not unlike, for example, I would imagine Perth, where most of the people are new. They've never gardened there. They don't know what can grow there. The climate is different there. And so I was sort of the, the, the advisor as to here's what you can grow. And once a week I wrote a column. And uh, every now and then I would write a column about tomatoes and tell people that, you know, wink, wink, this is about tomatoes, but it might be about cannabis as well. But I was a chemical head. I was a chemical head for sure. Uh, my family had a intricate – relationship with the founder of miracle grow uh he used to work for my father and my grandfather and so we 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 were always big into miracle grow and uh it wasn't until oh probably about 1990 uh one of my friends sent me a a picture of a nematode being strangled by uh uh a fungal hyphae it was trying to protect the root it's in the first book team with microbes and I saw that, and I said, uh-oh. <laughs> and I figured out uh, that maybe being organic meant something. And maybe these microbes, which we were always trying to get rid of, made a lot of sense. And so uh, I ended up finding Dr. Elaine Ingham, who is the guru of all things soil food web, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, became quite the disciple. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and it's impacted my life ever since. It's really been quite something. So just to clarify, when you, you were growing your first plants, were you using something like miracle Grow, or was it in like Absolutely. A- oh, sure, yeah. I was using miracle Grow up until, uh, up until I wrote the book, basically. I mean, the book came out in 2006. I, I really started writing the book in about 19, uh, 1998 or so. I had to write it a couple of times because the first time I wrote it, I wrote it as a comic book, and the publisher looked at it and said, you know, this may make sense, but we don't dumb books down. We we make them smarter. So if you rewrite this book in more scientific terms, we'll publish it. So they did. Uh, I did, and they did. And anyway, so it wasn't, it wasn't until about 1998 or 99 that I realized that the miracle Grow system, the system of using chemicals, was not the right way to grow plants didn't matter whether it was cannabis, a tomato, whether it was a flower, vegetable, uh, using, using chemicals does not make sense. And of course, this was long before, you know, we had Greta and other people telling us, yeah, it doesn't make sense for other reasons on top of what you think. So, uh, yeah, it was quite something and it was quite a turnaround. Uh, I had to basically admit to my readers that I'd been giving them bad advice for 25 years. And uh, I remember the newspaper ran a series of ads, which you could find in the newspaper boxes. It just had my back. back. Uh, And it said, uh, you know, in two weeks, Jeff Lohenfels is going to turn his back on 25 years of advice. And I did, thinking that all of my readers would, would abandon me immediately. What I discovered was there's an incredible thirst for organics that people 
want to be organic. They don't want to use chemicals. And it's only because they get forced into it that they end up, I think, succumbing to what we call a new way of gardening, which is actually, uh, you know, a destructive, terrible, terrible way of ruining, ruining soil and ruining the life in the soil. So long, long, long answer for, for a quick, quick question. No, they're our favorite type of answers. So I've got to ask you, you know, a favorite kind of topic amongst all organic growers. Do you remember your first organic harvest? Um, yes, I do, because the taste was completely different. I can taste those chemicals. I, I, you know, maybe it's in my head, maybe not. But, but the taste is different. And, of course, now we know that it's not just – you're not just doing this for the, for the plant. You're doing this for the worker, if that may be yourself, uh, and you're doing it for the environment as well. So it's become, become much more important than just simply growing a plant that tasted – clean and pure and and that you knew did not contain any of these things that probably are not that good for you so um yeah i remember and 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 uh i th i think that most people do and i think when most people go into a supermarket if the price was the same on food they would buy the organic over the non-organic period um the organization that i belong to of garden writers uh, it's a big national U.S. organization. Uh, I'm sure there's a counterpart in Australia. And there is not one of us, not one of us that isn't organic. Nobody willingly writes an article or does a television show or a podcast that says, hey, here's what you need to do. Go out to your nearest hardware store and find that smelly section and buy that crappy crap. It's chemical. And mix it in, you know. Now, the nearest we get to that, from my perspective, and you're going to get a lot of mail over this one, is hydroponics. You know, I mean, I don't think hydroponics is the same thing as soil either. Um, it's certainly a lot better than uh, the pesticide, herbicide chemical situation. But I, I like the idea of good living soil, period. 100%. I can get down with that. So... What was the initial response from the cannabis community in regards to the book? Did it take off or did it take a little bit of time before the wheels started to turn? Well, I wasn't really paying attention. Uh, when the book came out, uh, I was inundated with, or and it was frankly the subject matter, not the writing, but the book got great reviews, uh, you know, uh, most important book written in the past 25 years and maybe ever, holy, you know, I mean, like, good. <laughs> You know, aha, uh -huh, uh -huh, really? Uh, you know, I mean, and, and you know, horticulture, all these magazines and things picked it up and uh, be, and it became quite the topic for uh, what I call uh, the garden club circuit. And I run around the country and Canada and uh, I gave lectures on how to use microbes to grow your vegetables and everything else. And I wasn't paying attention to the cannabis market, frankly because it was underground uh, and and it wasn't as organized as it has become. Uh, it became evident, oh, probably around 2010, 2012, when Colorado started to legalize uh, here in the United States. Uh, it became evident that this book was being read by people who grow cannabis as well. Uh, one time I was sitting on an airplane going to a conference and somebody came up to me and said hey i read your book it grows the best weed ever and i was floored first of all that the person recognized me second that the person read the book but third that you know they were using it to grow cannabis and now of course uh i think my publisher has come to realize uh that the cannabis market is quite large and they read a lot of books in the cannabis world. So um, it's, it's become a Bible. And then, and then the other two books that, that go with it, it's a tri it's, I call it a trilogy series. Teaming with Microbes was the first one. And I really wrote it for Dr. Elaine Ingham. I didn't write it for myself or anything else. I mean, she asked me, you know, what could I do to help her? And I said, I can write you a book. And so I wrote the book. Um, Teaming with Nutrients, I wrote for myself because I was sitting in a restaurant with my wife, uh, I was looking at a picture of a bunch of women eating spaghetti, and I said to myself, you know, you're, you may be America's longest-running garden columnist, but you don't have any idea how plants eat. 
You know how plants get their food because that's what that first book told you. That's how plants get the food. But how do they take it in? And what do they do with it once it gets into their cells? Well, whew, that was teeming with nutrients. And it was, to me, uh, sort of a metaphysical, uh, trippy, holy crow. I mean, the numbers of cells in a single plant, what happens in each individual cell, the number, there are 10,000 individual kinds of enzymes in each individual cell in a plant. There are 10,000 of each one, maybe. I mean, there are gazillions of, I mean, ah, you know, and so all of a sudden, not only did I understand how a plant starts to work and how it gets put together, you know, how it works, how it eats, how it takes the food in, but then I started to realize, wait a minute, enzymes. Enzymes are proteins, you know, hmm, you know, maybe we need this and that, maybe the terpenes are, and all of a sudden, you can start to think like a cannabis plant uh, or any other kind of plant, and you know how to take care of it better. When you realize that these enzymes that I just talked about work best at 74 to 76 degrees, oh, oh, okay, well, maybe now I know what the right temperature is to grow everything, not just cannabis. But uh, so, yeah, it was a fascinating ride. And then, and then after that, I was asked to revise Teeming with Microbes because mycorrhizal fungi were coming onto the scene. When I wrote Teeming with Microbes, there were a paragraph on them. I mean, we couldn't grow them. They couldn't be duplicated. People thought they were ubiquitous. You know, if you've got them in Australia, I got them in Alaska. Uh, so, uh, but, but that turned out not to be true. And so I revised teaming with microbes. While I was doing that, it became very evident to me that over the next four or five years, there was research going on that was going to result in a need for a special book on uh, just these particular fungi uh, in general. And so there, that was teaming with microbes. It's not just about uh, um, uh, mycorrhizal fungi. It's about fungi in general. But oh my goodness gracious, when you take a look, for example, at, at the far, fires in Australia, if those mycorrhizal fungi live, you're going to get trees coming back. If they don't live, forget it. Those trees are not coming back. You're going to have prairie land. Well, that's kind of an amazing thing. And now we're able to grow them, we're able to duplicate them, and we're able to use them in growing specific plants. And so we know which one is the one that feeds cannabis. And if you use it, your cannabis plant is like no other cannabis plant you've ever seen. So, yeah, so that's the trilogy. They're a lot of fun, but they all start with the microbes. Yeah, what a really comprehensive overview of them all. So I guess the obvious kind of follow-up question is, your more recent book, DIY Autoflowering Cannabis. What was it that stimulated to do this one? Well, you know, that's a good question. I uh, I was influenced by the in, on the first book by a friend of mine, uh, Tom Alexander. Um, he was a very early cannabis grower during the illegal days. Uh, he helped coin the term um, um, uh, Sansamia. Uh, back in the day, and uh, he's the guy that that sent me the picture of the of the uh, nematode being strangled by the fungus. He and I are very very good friends. Uh, one day I was at his place in California, and he showed me these these tomato sized cannabis plants, and he said these are called auto flowering cannabis plants, and they're really kind of cool. Uh, you know, look at these cute little flowers. Blah blah blah. This was ten years ago. So uh, I decided to try to grow them, and, and they were fun, uh, nothing spectacular. Uh, but I live in Anchorage, Alaska, and in Anchorage, Alaska, you don't get days that are shorter than nights until September 21st. That's about the day of your first frost. So you're not going to get flowering cannabis in Anchorage, Alaska, unless you have a light deprivation situation, et cetera, et cetera. But these autoflowers don't have a photo period. They go from seed to flower based on genetics. So you end up with a flowering plant that's harvested after seven to nine weeks. 
So I'm thinking, again, I'm thinking like Australia. Now, in Australia, in the uh, capital territory, I guess it's now legal to grow cannabis. Yes, if people aren't growing auto-flowering cannabis there, they're making the biggest mistake Australians have ever made. They're making the biggest mistakes since bringing in the toads. Is that a, <laughs> I don't know if that's I can say that. Um, <laughs> because these things grow from seven to nine weeks to harvest, seed to harvest. That, that means you're limited to six plants. Well, they think, they think, you're going to get one or two harvests a year. They don't realize with your auto flowers, you're going to get, you know, so many more. But it turns out that these plants are now better than indica and sativa. And once that happened, I decided it was time to put my reputation on the line and and sort of help the auto flower industry get, get going uh, because – they are so much better than regular indica sativas with which they're bred. Um, so let me list let me list the things I like about them. And and uh, I, I should preface this by saying the book is called uh, DIY Auto Flowering Cannabis. Uh, it is not a book for the professional grower. This is a book for the professional grower's mother, or brother, or aunt, or uncle. Uh, it goes from soup to nuts on cannabis. But it centers around this idea that we now have a plant that doesn't have an auto period that goes from seed to flower based on genetics that's easy to grow. In fact, if you fertilize them in good soil, they won't do well because it's, their soil is too rich. Uh, they uh, are small tomato-sized plants, and yet today, not true – Four years ago, but today, the yield on them per acre is better than the yield in sativa uh, uh, indica uh, yields. Unbelievable. So um, I'm predicting right here on your show that in the next five years, nobody will be growing except occasionally uh, the bigger plants. Everybody will be growing auto flowering cannabis. And I wanted the world to know about it. Uh, I believe this is a plant you're going to be able to get at your local nursery every spring. I believe this is a plant you're going to be able to buy seeds from the seed rack. You grow it at home in a five-gallon bucket. Uh, you reuse the soil. You don't have to spray it with anything. It grows so fast that it, it grows through cycles where it would have problems. So, you know, it, if, if there's a bug that wants that plant, by the time the bug gets settled in, the plants already grown through the next stage. Oh my goodness gracious! They flower after two weeks. So you know this is a terrific, terrific new plant. I felt it needed a book. This is again not a book for the professional, and it's not what I call a cannabis porn book. <laughs> we have so many cannabis porn books. You know, beautiful buds and beautiful colors and sizes, and you know, but. But, you know, this is a how-to for your mother, and if it's legal where she's growing, you should buy her this book, and get it on Amazon just like the other ones, and, and get her some seeds and get her into this plant because it's a fun, fun plant to grow. Auto flowers, uh, uh, you know, it's fun to grow a, a, a sativa and indica. It's a hundred times more fun to grow an auto flower. They grow right before your eyes. Unbelievable. Indoors and outdoors. Yeah, that's amazing. You you basically answered the the most of the next question I was going to ask, which was, did you kind of like you know without necessarily thinking about it, write this as something which would kind of get the older generations who might be a little more skeptical and just kind of bridge that gap for and make it that little bit easier for them to get into it. Well, yeah, yeah. Part of my thinking was this is a book for my mother, even though she's no longer here. But uh, you know, this is the kind of book my mother. She was a gardener. She loved to grow things, and she'd try anything new. The last time something new came to America, it was the snap pea. I don't know if you've got them down where you are, but the, the snap pea came, and everybody went nuts for them. Everybody went nuts for them, you know? Nobody had to write a book about it. Uh, unfortunately, cannabis has had such a bad rap uh, that I that I, I think I, I, the book needed to be written because uh, – it deals with the stigma. It deals with why it's illegal. It deals with all the silliness. Uh, 
but it also introduces people to the notion of strains and land races and, uh, uh, you know, all, all of those things. In fact, uh, one of the pictures I've got in there is a strain, they call it uh, here in the United States, the Australian bastard. Uh, and it's a yeah. spectacular looking little plant. It's got millions of little leaves. Uh, and people are breeding it right now with autoflowers, developing some very interesting plants from it. So uh, uh, it's just a, it's fun. And, and I think I think this is the next tomato. Uh, I don't I don't know if where you are, tomatoes are a big hobby plant, but but here in the United States, they're the you know they're the holy grail of gardening. You know, to get a fresh tomato and to give it to your neighbor. You know, you know, is like uh, wearing the sheriff's badge in town. You know, I'm a gardener, <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you know, this is this is, I think, the next tomato plant. It's a lot of fun to grow, and frankly, I would say here here in the states, oh, maybe a quarter of the growers, pr- commercial growers, are now using these. Um, they they're replacing the bigger guys because the yields are bigger. It's hard for people to believe that, particularly people who've used auto flowers in the past not the same genetics they used to be yeah okay so maybe a slightly redundant question in that you could maybe infer your answer but are you kind of on board with the no-till movement is that the the oh absolutely absolutely uh uh uh, the no-till movement is a part of soil food webby uh thinking uh if you till your soil, and, and I'll, I'll relate this to cannabis in a minute. If you till your soil, first of all, you're breaking up that wonderful mycorrhizal fungi, which is described in teeming with fungi. Uh, you're, 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 when you cut a worm in half, you don't get two worms. You get half a dead worm, uh, you know, two halves a dead worm. Uh, when you, unless you hit it at the 18th segment, in which case one half might live. Uh, when you have bacteria that are up here, you rototill, you put them down here. They're supposed to be up here. Actinomycetes are supposed to be deeper in the soil. Now, anyway, uh, rototilling is a very, very bad thing to do. Um, and when you grow cannabis, I would go one step further. I reuse my soil. I'm regenerative. Um, I reuse the roots. I leave the, the. I cut the stem. I plant right in the pot without pulling the plant out. That's how much no-till I believe in. Uh, those roots have been putting out exudates into that soil, attracting and feeding the right kind of cannabis microbes. Uh, those roots provide pathways for new roots to travel down. Um, and by not breaking it up, of course, you've left the mycorrhizal fungi that are there in place with spores so that the plant becomes infected as it grows into it. So yeah, no-till. I'm really big on no-till, uh, and and I'm, I I I love to till. It's so much fun. Uh, it, it's one of it's one of gardening's joys, and yet it's the worst thing you can do. Do not roto-till. After you garden the first time, fine. After that, never again. Now, why do people roto-till? Well, this is a this is an interesting uh, thing, and it applies to places like uh, like uh, Alaska and uh, 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 the United States during the colonial period, Australia, uh, New Zealand, places that were being settled during the early 1800s, uh, uh, late 1700s. An English guy uh, codified what everybody thought, and that was that plants ate soil. It's called the humus theory of, of growing. And if plants ate soil, this guy said, hmm, let's just pulverize it up. If we pulverize it up, it'll be easier for him to eat it. So he invented rototilling. Now, in the United States, in Australia, in New Zealand, uh, in, in places where there was old growth forest and settlers came, they didn't want to grow old growth. They wanted to grow vegetables to eat. And so they cut the old growth down and old growth forests are supported by soils that are very heavy in fungi. Vegetables like cannabis are supported by uh, uh, bacteria based soils, some fungi, but mostly bacteria. And when you rototill, you convert old growth soil into bacterial soil. 
And once you do it, you've got bacteria soil. You don't have to do it again and again and again and again and again. And we do. And we're losing soil all around the world as a result. It's a bad, bad, bad thing to do. So uh, you should you reuse the soil in your pots at a minimum. Just re, you know, compost it and then reuse it after three months. Uh, but you can grow three, four times in the same pot uh, without without changing it at all. You feed the soil with compost and compost teas, uh, but but you don't rototill. Yeah, great answer. So what's your thoughts on some of the new, quote, organic companies we see coming out that kind of have these long-lasting granular solutions you put in the soil and water over time? You know, have you come across these and what's your thoughts? Yeah, it depends on what they're using. I mean, you know, uh, uh, perlite's getting a bad rap these days because it doesn't go away. Uh, People are using a lot more cocoa coir. Which is a good recyclable product that can that's porous, uh, so it, it, it's good. Um, you know the the companies I worry about are the ones that use the word organic without any certification. Uh, I don't trust those companies at all. And and organic is a word that people kick around and regenerative as well. Uh, you got to have country standards and they got to be followed. Then you know you're getting something good. Um, there are a lot of new products that people are bringing on board. Uh, some of them are GMO products. Um, some of them are uh, made by GMO products. In other words, they're not GMO themselves, but they're made by GMO uh, bacteria. Uh, so you got to be very careful about what you're using. I'm, I'm pretty pure about, about the term organics. Uh, I'm pretty old-fashioned about it as well. Now, mycorrhizal fungi. Wow, they never had that as a kid, when I was a kid. Uh, it's organic. Uh, so, yeah, so there's, there's new things coming into the organic field uh, that are certainly worth following. And, and uh, uh, a lot of IPM kind of stuff, uh, you know, coming in as well and fascinating. Some of the great stuff that's happening. So uh, very excited about it. And the cannabis field is the field, I think, that leads it all. Uh, it used to be the viniculture uh, not the not the farmers. I'm sorry, uh, but now I think it's the cannabis growers. Uh, really, some of the best gardeners I've ever ever worked with. Uh, I do advising uh, all over the place. I've got a team of people. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're in Colombia, Mexico, Alaska, Canada. Uh, you know, Kansas doesn't matter. Uh, if you're growing cannabis, there's a way to do it. That's the right way. And if you're open to it, wow really is something else. The results are incredible, absolutely incredible. So that's been the best thing about all of this stuff is that people come up to me and they and they tell me that they've converted uh, and that they've never looked back. I go, yes, because uh, I don't make any money off of this stuff, I can tell you. My publisher might make some, but uh, – <laughs> You know, it's, it's when somebody writes a letter or you call up and say, you know, let's do a podcast or, you know, you give me a nice introduction there. Uh, you know, that's that's what this is all about because we, we've we screwed things up. Uh, I'm, you know, 70 years old and uh, right now my, my goddess is Greta. Uh, you know, we've got to make sure that she gets the garden and her kids get the garden, period. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's cannabis or tomatoes. Uh, if we if we don't do it organically, um, you know, they're not going to make it, period. Simple as that. Yep. The sentiment I can get behind again. It's kind of the theme, theme of my side of the comments. But a question I'm sure a ton of fans want to know. Would you be able to give us a little basic, <clears throat> excuse me, would you be able to give us a little basic rundown of your growing setup? And by that, I just mean, what type of amendments do you like to use when you're doing your soil? And, you know, do you have, um, you know, just little things you like to do? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I travel an awful lot. So uh, th- that's one of the nice things about the auto flowers uh, is, is that I can come back and they're done. Um, so I do a lot of t- I do a lot of tent growing in the winter. Uh, so I've got a nice line tent that I've made myself uh, using electrical uh, poles, you know, that I've rigged together using the little circuit socket things, you know, they fit in. Anyway, uh so I've got a tent that grows about four to six plants, and then I, outdoors uh, I live on I live on eight acres, and I I garden on about three or two or three of them. Uh, I've got a small outdoor greenhouse and 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 an indoor greenhouse as well. Um, 
the mix I use is 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 based with something called Alaska humus. Uh, this is a very rich uh, natural soil from Alaska. In Anchorage, we have uh, earthquakes all the time, and this soil has to be removed, 80 feet of it, and put into landfills where it's no longer available uh, before you can build. Uh, the giant cabbages that people associate with Alaska, they are grown in this stuff in a in an area outside of Anchorage where it's it's you know got a little six inch layer right down in the root zone. Uh, so it's very very rich rich a microbial biological soil. In fact, Dr. Elaine once said it has the highest microbiology of any soil she's ever seen. Now, uh, I basically plant in that with, uh, I'll put in some cocoa in it just for, just for good drainage. Uh, I'll put a little green sand in it. Uh, I'll put a little bit of, uh, uh, fish, fish hydrolyzite in it. Uh, but that's basically it. Now, for most people, uh, good compost is is a good starter because it provides the indigenous microbes from your own area. These are microbes that are going to live in your area. So the fact that I'm using Alaska humus, and basically what Alaska humus is, is, is compost. Uh, it just happens to be from, from out in the wild. Every summer it thaws. Every winter it freezes. It's been going on for 10,000 years, and it's this beautiful, beautiful black. Smells delicious. Um, that streptomyce- that's a streptomycin cell smell that's in there that's uh, beautiful stuff. Anyway, uh, you've got it all, over, all around the world, but if you don't, you make compost. And that compost you make on the ground. You don't make it in a machine because you want indigenous microbes to come up from the soil in the ground and get into your compost pile. Uh, or you make vermicompost uh, and and uh, you put in indigenous soil into the vermicompost bin if you use a bin. Vermicompost is terrific because it's got concentrated uh, uh, nutrients in it that, that, that compost doesn't have. Um, that should be the base for everybody's everybody's uh, grow. Now, if you've got a big, gigantic farm, that's hard to do. Uh, and so you, you, you just have to constantly make compost. You've got to constantly amend. You've got to constantly uh, uh, you know, feed and take care of stuff. And it's important uh, that once you, once you get your soil, that you keep it alive. I use compost teas and compost extracts. A compost extract is nothing more than taking compost, putting it into a, 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 a cheesecloth, uh, you know, set up and just squeezing it in warm water for 15 minutes. You end up squeezing out the microbes. You don't multiply them, but you, you extract them out. And so you feed them. I always have a layer of compost down on the base of my plants, uh, not on the base, but at the base of my plants. Um, and once every five or six grows, uh, I will uh, actually dig in, uh, uh, depending on what the tests show that it needs, what it needs. I use a living mulch, usually a sweet clover mulch, uh, which is which is easy to do. And I test with something that most people have never heard of, called a microbiometer. Uh, I advise this. Co- I advise this company because once I saw this thing, I went crazy. I've always looked for something that I could say to people, your product teams with microbes. Buy my seal, I'll give you an endorsement. Now, how do you do that? Well, you know, how do you show that something teams with microbes? You can look it under a microscope and everything else, but that really doesn't tell you anything. What this this does, this tells you the changes in biomass in your soil. Biomass is basically the microbes in your soil. And so... Uh, to do a biomass test for most soil tests, it's $500. It takes a month, maybe three weeks if you're lucky. Uh, this is a test that this woman has developed that you use your iPhone or your, your Android, doesn't matter which. Uh, you use a phone. You, uh, uh, you take the sample. You mix it out in the field in about seven to ten minutes. And then you do a reading right there, it costs you five bucks. And it tells you what the biomass is of your soil. Now, if you're putting a good organic fertilizer on your plant, 
the biomass increases because the microbes go out and eat it up, and et cetera. And you can tell what's happening to your plant what's, by looking at the microbiometer test. So if you're a grower, you can tell when the plant begins to flower. The exudates slow down. And you, you get a lower biomass. So it's a fascinating new tool that's being tested here in the United States. Uh, it's being sold in Australia, actually. And you can get it on the web. Go look at the, the www.microbiometer.com. Uh, fascinating new tool. Uh, and, and basically, if I do a test and I have a test that's over about five or 600, I don't do anything to my soil. Nothing. I'll just take the, the Alaska humus put a little choir in it for drainage, and that's it. Simple as that. So it's a very interesting new tool that I think is going to help people test their soil and know what to do with it, particularly when they're growing cannabis because, let's face it, you know, it's not that hard a plant to grow. It's, it's a, a, a plant you can screw up easily, but it's not that hard to grow if you, if you, if you do it right. So, Yeah. Brilliant. And I, I've actually bought some of those tests myself, and I can definitely vouch for what you're saying. They're very good, aren't they? Yeah, they're, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And the difference, for example, I use it in, in, in Alaska in the spring. It tells me when spring hits. I see a, 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 an increase in the biomass when the trees start to drop the, you know, the, the exudates start to increase. That tells me it's time to tell my readers you're about to be outdoors soon because uh, the trees never never lie. Uh, it's fascinating. It's a great new tool and great things are happening. And uh, my understanding is it's even being improved. So uh, I wish I, I wish I knew who the uh, distributors were in Australia. But anyway, it's it's a great new tool. Yeah, fantastic. I just wanted to loop back quickly to a topic we were talking about earlier when you mentioned that you're uh, fond of products that have the organic certification and whatnot. Are there any that you basically recommend to steer clear of? Because in the past, and particularly in the cannabis industry, some of our guests, and including myself, have been quite skeptical of the OMRI registration, which is, yeah, a bit yeah. sinister. Do you think there are some that aren't as good as others? Yeah, I don't think OMRI is sinister. I just don't think it's as comprehensive as it could be. Um, there is a, a company that I don't, I, I, you know, that uses the word organic all the time. I would never touch their lights. I would never touch their fertilizer. I would never touch their soil. I would never listen to the nasty Scots guy that yells at me and tells me to put the stuff on uh, in the in on my lawn in the spring. And I think you know who I'm speaking of. <laughs> uh, and I don't like them because they make people see. Yeah, so you got to be careful. Omri, Omri is, is very simple to get. And that's the problem with it. They won't give it to just anybody, but it's too simple to get to be very, very comfortable. Uh, very often it makes sense to actually, now that we've got the web, go on the web and contact the companies and, and ask for the, uh, they call them manufacturer product sheets and, and, and things like that and, and tests. And, and a lot of these companies have it. Uh, so I think that's that's what you really need to look for find one that's good then and stick with it um and then i i also like i like to go into uh nurseries and to grow stores and find out what's what are people really getting good results from what's what makes sense what do you guys like you know and i look at it and i smell it and i you know i try it uh so it's fascinating how many new things there are out there whoa and the big guys are getting in there, so I, I, I won't mention the name of that particular one, uh, but but I will mention Bayer. Uh, and you know what they're doing now is they're trying to figure out how to how to modify a plant so that it'll produce its own nitrogen, which is a great thing. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure how they're going to do it. Uh, they're trying to make plants uh, give off the signal that attracts mycorrhizal fungi, so they can. It's you know the things that they're doing. Part of me says, "Gee, that's interesting, and maybe it's going to be good." But the way they go about it, maybe not good. So we've got to, we just got to keep our eyes open, and we have to talk to each other about this stuff. That's why I, I love giving talks. I love going to conventions. Uh, we have them here in the United States, all over the place. I mean, my goodness gracious, you, you know, every any place that legalizes cannabis ends up with a good conference every other month <laughs> and there are lots of them and, and so it's very interesting to see who who thrives who doesn't uh who people frequent and who they don't uh, it's, it's it's the bad guys are getting known out there pretty pretty well yeah uh, 
Well, that, that actually perfectly segues into the next question in that we do see commercial ag kind of moving into the cannabis scene. What do you think is a role they can play that's not going to be the downfall? And more importantly, do you think there's anything that they're already currently doing that could be brought to the cannabis industry that we just haven't adopted yet? Well, let me, let me, let me divide the ag thing into two. The first is sort of the information ag, you know, the magazines. Oh, my God. There are a gazillion. I'm sitting on the floor here. <laughs> there are a gazillion, a gazillion magazines on cannabis. Too many. And of course, uh, I've written a couple of articles that have not been printed <laughs> because I, I write articles like, uh, no, don't use this product. Don't use that product. Uh, you know, these are bad people. Anybody associated with glyphosate shouldn't be trusted, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and they won't print them. Why? because the space has been invaded. Uh, and we now know, of course, that big ag uh, and, you know, and big hydro uh, has invaded the space. And uh, so as well as big, uh, bad guy, good guys, you get bad guys as well. And, and, and that has happened. So, so the information that you get may be wrong in the first place. And that worries me quite a bit. Um, when you pick up a magazine, you can't trust the advertising. You, the, don't don't trust the advertising. I don't know what else to say. Uh, so that's the first problem. The, the second problem, of course, is that big ag tends to have the idea that they're going to do oils in mind. Uh, you know, that's they're not they're not in it for individual flowers yet. I don't see you know a big tobacco company uh, saying, okay, we're going to make tobacco, then we're going to make cannabis joints. It will come for sure. And I'm sure there'll be uh, cigar companies that'll make blunts. Uh, uh, but right now, it seems to me that what Big Egg is interested in is uh, being able to produce enough leaf that they're able to, uh, you know, make oils out of and, and waxes and that kind of stuff. And and uh, I don't I don't know whether that's healthy for the industry. A, I don't mean that in terms of lung problems and all that kind of stuff. Um, the ability to be able to grow indoors at a greenhouse is phenomenal. The ability to be able to use good lighting is phenomenal. Um, and I think that Big Egg can bring that and uh, uh, the electronic, the electronics that they have associated with them into the cannabis world. Uh, I mean, you, you know as well as I know that when someone sits in a tractor these days, it's more like sitting in a living room than it is, you know, it's like a, being in a Tesla, Tesla television sets and satellite navigation and all that kind of gar garbage and stuff. And so, but, you know, a lot of that stuff probably makes sense. Uh, light deprivation, uh, new greenhouse materials, uh, the ability to be able to control water and, and save water uh, and purify, uh, the ability to be able to control mildew, all that kind of stuff I think makes a lot of sense. A lot of the genetic testing uh, not associated with the cannabis itself, but genetic testing associated with the, the diseases and the viruses and the bugs uh, so the, the things that that feed it, all that kind of stuff is, is going to be helpful and, and is, is being applied already. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think there is a lot in Big A. I worry they don't know what they're doing. I worry about the little guy. Uh, but then I, I, you know, I'm always reminded about the wine industry and that there's always room for the low label and the little label and et cetera, et cetera. Well, okay. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to see cannabis – turn into a mass produced uh, uh, chemically sprayed grown bad for you uh, item I mean I don't think there's any excuse for that and and uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed about how we've how we've gone about legalization because I don't think we've done it the right way uh, we haven't we haven't looked at this from any other uh, any other way than uh, we need we need to convince governments and the only way to convince governments is with money taxation and that was the wrong way to go about it so uh whew, that was way off track 
No, it was it was perfect, and I want to even follow that up with a kind of a complex issue we haven't been able to dive into too much in the past, but I think you're going to be perfect for it. So we know for a fact that there are companies out there such as Molecular Farms and their parent companies who are genetically modifying cannabis specifically to do things like so that every plant is expressing the exact same phenotype, same height and everything. So the idea is that like they can be perfectly harvested by like a combine in the field that's just going to optimize to pick them all. The fear is that one of the things they're doing is modifying the terpene profiles so that for example there's zero mercine and the fear is that these are such genetically dominant plants that if they do hermaphrodite which you hope they wouldn't but if they do and there's a big field of this if that pollen were to get into some regular stock it would essentially wipe out the gene for say mercine in this situation and over time you know worst case scenario has man gone too far we could lose certain things do you think that's a realistic fear or it's a bit of paranoia well, I think it is a fear. I think I think there's some realism to it. I mean, people in Oregon, for example, worry about hemp. You know, the 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 pollen from hemp uh, getting onto the pollen from can you know to a to a medical cannabis farm, et cetera, et cetera. And and it can be a problem. So I think we have to be, we we you know we treated this thing so badly for so long, you know, that there aren't enough lines of communication so we can talk about these things and and kind of kind of make it work out. But yeah, I think there's a I think there's a potential problem. We just have to pay attention to it, and we have to have control of it. Not government that's interested in money. We shouldn't care about the money. We should care about the health and the impact on ourselves and the environment. That's got to be number one when it comes to cannabis. Let's not fall into the trap where it's just money talks, because that's what happens, as we know. Uh, and and. The idea of genetic genetic modification it may turn out right now I I, I think the jury is is out uh, in terms of part of the genetic modification pro, uh, issue, but I think the jury is right on 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 the mark. If genetic modification is being used so that they can spray the plant with a pesticide, then it's absolutely no way. If it's being used to make the plant a better plant and you can control it then possibly but even then i'm not sure i'm just not sure uh you know for years and years and years and centuries and centuries and centuries we've been able to breed this plant the way we want to with regular breeding methods what's wrong with that exactly until we can figure it out until we can figure it out let's not screw things up that's that's the scary thing yeah so last little question on the kind of legal side of things recently we've heard the sentiment that 215 in california was maybe not the best idea what legal changes would you like to see to kind of create a more conducive environment for the cannabis market to thrive for all growers not just the big ones it's a that's a really difficult question well now i always say this is an alaskan the first thing is no bill gets passed using the word marijuana <laughs> This, this is a word that I cannot stand and I don't think anybody who ever touches cannabis should ever use because in the United States, this is a word that was drenched up by a guy named Harry Enslinger. Harry Enslinger was head of the tobacco and, and uh, alcohol administration when prohibition was ending. And he went, oh, what am I going to do and what are my people going to do? And he's the guy – that started the worldwide paranoia over the the use of cannabis, which he called marijuana. So, uh, when you use the word marijuana, you're putting a, a, a you're putting a statue up to Harry Anslinger. Harry Anslinger caused uh, Australia, Bolivia, Colombia, uh, London, uh, you know, Ottawa to pass these draconian, terrible, terrible laws. Uh, so the first thing I would do is make sure that everybody uses the word cannabis. That's what this plant is. It's cannabis. I know marijuana is a word in Spanish that was used once, uh, but not very often. Um, I would, I would uh, uh, reduce the taxation element. I think this has just become way out of hand. Uh, uh, I would definitely, in the United States, we have a serious problem where, where the dis, a disproportionate number of, of minority uh, citizens 
uh, have been put away as a result of cannabis uh, uh, problems in the past, the prohibition. And I, I would uh, have laws that, that give an advantage uh, to to uh, uh, minorities that have been impacted for a certain period of time. Um, and and beyond that, I don't have enough expertise, but I know the system is broken. I know that in California, there is a wild, wicked, uh, you know, n- uh, illegal market. And it's very viable, uh, and it's and it's very healthy, uh, and so I think I think the fact that that exists tells me that the law failed. Um, we got a terrible problem in uh, uh, Alaska that I think most other places have. There's way too many restrictions on this plant, way too many restrictions. It's just a plant. If you grow it next to a school, so what? It's just the way it is. Uh, if you grow it next to a church, sorry. Uh, it's just a plant. I mean, there was a period of time when people in the United States thought that the tomato plant was poisonous. Uh, and, and you know, you couldn't eat a tomato plant. Uh, uh, this is just a plant, folks. And, and as such, we need to start treating it like a plant. Uh, if we need to get a little bit of taxation, okay, I can understand that. Uh, but so far, we've seen that crime rates have gone down. Drug rates among teenagers have gone down. Uh, there's probably been an increase in driving, uh, I would imagine, although I don't know whether, whether that's necessarily bad. But if it is, then let's do a little bit of taxation so that we can, we can ameliorate that a little bit. Um, but goodness gracious, this is not the B-wall answer to every, this is This is not going to pay for my health care. Uh, it just shouldn't. It's not so we need to treat we need to treat the plant like a plant. We need to have laws that treat the plant like a plant, uh, not like this is some kind of a syndicate. Uh, we need to be very careful that we don't give licenses just to a few, uh, which which a couple of states in the United States have done. Um, you know, we just we just gotta pay attention. So I don't know. Uh, it's a wide open thing. I'm, I'm I'm too old to to but I am so thankful that it is legal in so many places in the United States. And it, and it will be around the world, no question. Yeah, it seems like the, the tide's are turning. So for the next section, we're just going to jump on to some fan-submitted questions. So just some more kind of short ones, I think. So first question is, do you know if plants release root exudates if they're being fed salts or in a hydro environment? Uh, they might, but they might not. Uh, they they put the exudates out in response to a need, and if they're being fed, then they don't need to waste their synthetic their photosynthetic energy to produce the exudates. In a hydro environment, you can get uh, you can get exudates, uh, but you don't get nearly as many. Uh, and they, of course, they don't have any purpose. Uh, so you know that's that you don't want them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So next one looks like from a reader who's maybe read your new book. They've said, do you have a favorite autoflowering company and do you have any tips for training autoflowers? Well, uh, I like Mephesto Genetics. Here, here. Um, yeah, they're, they're a good you know, international company. Uh, they, they really have some terrific seeds. Uh, and boy, oh boy, are they on top of their genetics. As far as training... What I think I'm coming to the conclusion is that it's it's best not to train. Um, I don't. I I, I I wish that the people like Mephesto and they're getting much better at it would would tell you this is a plant that should be pinched or this is a plant that should not be pinched. Um, but other uh, you know other than pinching, I I think that training is is really counterproductive. Uh, and even pinching, pinching, I don't, I don't really think really helps you that much. Yeah. So I, let me finish the answer. Don't train your plant. <laughs> after the after the first grow, if it, if it looks like it could it could have been, go ahead and do it. Yeah. Yeah. Great answer. So. And I've tried I've tried it all. I mean, I've tried tying them down and pinching and you know screes and all that kind. Of, you know, it's. Yeah, spread the stuff out a little bit, but you know, these are such a great easy plants to grow. And they're so fast, they don't need very much training. Yeah, definitely. So next question, kind of similarly related. Have you ever noticed an increased prevalence of intersex traits in autoflowers? Or have you noticed what some describe as a common terpene amongst autoflowers? 
yes and no. If you get different different growers, you get different terpene profiles for sure. Um, I th- I think some of the, the the smaller newer growers are using a smaller gene pool, and so they don't have quite the quite the. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I, I like Mephisto. I like the big guys. I don't, you know, I love Mephisto. Don't get me wrong. I think they're terrific people. But there's also a thing called autoflowering.net, which I think people might want to go on to, uh, which has lists a lot of different growers, a lot of different different things, uh, and 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 you can find them as well. But you, you tend to get, the, yeah, you tend to get kind of the same out of the same grower. I I, I think that may be true. Um, I haven't gr- I haven't really grown enough to really know that whether that's uh, but I got to tell you what I got was good enough I couldn't complain yummy yummy yeah fantastic I'm a huge fan of Mephisto as well so next question this is one I should have asked so very near and dear to my heart is this is how I actually found out about your book what do you think about the revs true living organics oh I like it yeah I know him uh, I met him I met him when he was a young kid. Uh, that's not true, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, there's a, there are a lot of great books out there. Uh, and, and, uh, I think it's important that people get a good library, uh, of different kinds of books, uh, and, and, and refer to them as, as many times as they possibly can. Yeah. There's the, 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 the library field is, whew, I mean, the cannabis field is getting incredible. Again, I, I tend to stay away from the, from the uh, pornographic, uh, ones, <laughs> Good answer. So uh, recently, we've seen a lot of discussion around the topic of defoliation. And I think you've said in the past, you're anti-defoliation. Would you mind giving us an explanation as to why you are that? Well, two reasons. One is if you've got a good light, you want to have as many light receivers as you possibly can, period. Uh, And every one of those fan leaves that you're taking off your plant because you think you're getting better air circulation is a is a factory of thousands of gazillions, you know, of chloroplasts that are feeding your plant, and so it's just counterproductive to remove those unless you absolutely have to move your fan, <laughs> get a different air system, uh, but do not take off uh, leaves. Now, if you've got a really good light setup, you're way ahead by leaving those those leaves on. If you're and if you've got a lousy light setup, you're way ahead by leaving those leaves. Uh, they're just factories. You want to have as many as you possibly can. Yeah, great answer. So, next one is a really good question, in my opinion. Have you ever considered getting your books turned into audio books? And would you consider doing the voice if so? Uh, I'm not sure I could pronounce all the words. For goodness' sakes. Yeah, I mean, I would. I would certainly consider it, but I, I'd rather have it in Spanish or Chinese. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's it's in electronic versions, but it's not in audio. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't know what that process is. I'd have to ask my my uh, my publisher. Uh, I don't know whether whether they do that stuff, but yeah, I would certainly do that. I don't think you'd want my voice. I think you'd want uh, let's get some some really, you know, somebody really good. Jim Belushi, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Um, so, have you been keeping up to date with any of the new lighting technology? And if so, have you got any thoughts on the new plasma lights? Yeah, I love plasma lights. Uh, I advise uh, a company uh, called uh, Second Sun Light on Demand. Um, it's it's just incredible. The plasma lights are phenomenal. The old days, you used to have to have two different kinds of plasma lights, one for flowering, one for vegging. Not anymore. Uh, and this particular light that I'm that I'm interested in, it weighs about mm, I don't know ten to fifteen pounds, uh, and it doesn't put out any heat. It uses about half the electrical uh, output wattage. Um, it is. The cat's meow, and it grows the finest cannabis you have ever, 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 ever seen. Uh, just spectacular, and and I can't wait. I don't, I don't have one yet, but I want one so I can grow my auto flowers. Uh, auto flowers, by the way, I like to keep mine a, on a twenty-four hour, twenty-four hour light cycle. Uh, when you grow a twenty-four hour light cycle with a plasma light, uh, auto flowers, holy cremolo. You get a yield like you cannot believe, and the tastes 
the 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 uh, I mean, my God, it's just incredible. It's just unbelievable. So, uh, yeah, I, I I like plasma lights an awful lot. I, they last a very long time. The thing that that people don't realize when they buy an LED light, they break. They don't last forever. Uh, they end up in the landfill. Uh, ugh. Ugh. Uh, these these plasma lights are a little bit more expensive. Uh, and again, I, I would I would highly uh, encourage people to take a look at the second sun, knowing that I I do advise these guys. This is this is the light. Uh, it is the sun, and and. Uh, you know, there's no substitute. What we do as growers very often is we try to skimp. Okay. Now, normally you're growing a plant outdoors. That's where it's supposed to grow, under good sunlight. The last thing in the world you want to skimp is your light. And people do that. And they shouldn't. Just a terrible thing. Growing cannabis is a three-legged stool. And if you want to grow good cannabis, you have to have good genetics. That's a given. You've got to have good soil. From my perspective, it's got to be a healthy, healthy living soil. And the third thing is you've got to have good lights. If you've got those three things, you can't fail to grow good, good cannabis. Great answer. So last question from our little fan submitted ones is, what type of things do you like to, to do to get rid of bugs? Like, for example, if you had russet mites, what might you do to help get rid of them? Yeah, I'm a big believer. First of all, if you're if you're a commercial grower, you have got to have on call an IPM specialist. Simple as simple as that. If you don't have an IPM specialist, you're crazy. I, I can never pronounce the names of any of these things, uh, but I'm a big big believer in IPM. Uh, when you when you start out, however, with a good healthy soil, the opportunity for the soil food web to start taking out your problems. Uh, on its own is increased many, 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 many times. Um, but russet mites, yeah, russet mites is one of those things. What did I hear about russet mites? Russet mites were sprayed in the United States by uh, one of the utility, this is the rumor, utility companies in order to kill the vegetation underneath the wires. Wait a minute. Uh, you mean those russet mites in California all come from, and phew, people have it like crazy. Uh <laughs> if you can use UV lights, you know, that kind of stuff, I always like to do that kind of stuff. You want to outcompete. You want to know what life cycle stages the, the, the problem is, is going to go through. And you want to find something in the soil food web medicine chest that outcompetes that guy for space, for food, uh, and, you know, that puts out an antibiotic that it doesn't like. Uh, there's something out there for anything. Uh, but the best place to go is is get on the web right away and contact an IPM specialist because they know what they're doing. And chances are that that whoever you're contacting, he, that he or she has already been contacted by 13 people, your neighbors and everybody else, because they got the same problems that you have. So they know how to take care of them. That's That's how you do it. A brilliant answer. So on to our last two or three questions before we wrap it up. So favorite one we like to ask people, what is your favorite or the best weed you've ever smoked in your whole life? I love Durban Poison. Uh, Durban Poison uh, from Oregon's finest. That's a dispensary here in town. Uh, one of my friends has a farm. He grows the Durban Poison for it. It's a delicious uplifting, terrific, terrific cannabis plant. Uh, just simply love it. Uh, again, because I vaporize uh, flour, I'm always looking for good flavor. Uh, and by the way, hemp is pretty good to vaporize, I got to say. It's, uh, it's delicious. Uh, the, hemp, the hemp that's grown in Oregon is, uh, all, gonna, is all CBG hemp. Uh, very interesting uh, medical properties uh, to it. So very, very interesting stuff. But Durban poison, that's without question my favorite. Very good answer. So on the other end of the spectrum, what is the least memorable or the weed that least impressed you? Well, you know, that would have to be the weed from the very, very first time. <laughs> very, very first time I got stoned. My good friend Jeremy Platt and I, we must have gone through 30, 40 pipes full before we finally got stoned because back in 1970 let's see what was that oh my god 1968 uh 
they're, they're, you know, oh, uh, this was right before Thai sticks and all, all sorts of great weed started coming into the United States from Vietnam. Uh, but boy, the early weed was terrible stuff. Terrible stuff. Awful. Never want to go back to that again. Sticks and seeds. <laughs> Headaches. Yeah, common sense. Headaches for those of you who have never tried it. Yeah. Uh, so if you were sent to a desert island, you could only have two or three strains with you. Which ones would you want to take? Well, I think I'd probably take. Uh, uh, I would, I, depending on whether I was limited to auto flowers or not. Um, Anything you want. I would take. I would have to take a couple of regular plants to do some breeding. So I would want to have, because uh, I think it's probably a pretty quick grower. Uh, I think Blue Dream is very good, very good, easy grower. Um, I would like to take uh, any of Mephesto's uh, wonderful plants. I like Hubba Bubba, uh, Hubba Bubba Smello. Smelloscope. <laughs> yeah, Hubba Bubba Smelloscope. Good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that one. That was just terrific. I would I would take that. God, I don't know. It's just I would grab whatever I could get. Uh, people give me seeds. You know, I get seeds all the time. I I I, I, I just like to grow any of it all. It all turns out to be good. And, and, you know, again, if you grow your cannabis organically and you provide those necessary elements that go into those terrific enzymes that are in your plant, those 10,000 individual enzymes of which there are thousands of each are going to do some incredible things Uh and and that's that's just all it really takes. This is such a wonderful hobby. Uh, it's just so easy to do, and it's just so much fun. God, I love it. <laughs> you can hardly shut me up, as you can tell. Oh, I love it. I love it. So we're going to do a modified final question just for you. So if you could go back anywhere in like the history of time, any place you want, and you can get some humus from anywhere, where and when are you going? Humus from anywhere. Um, boy, that's a tough one. I would like to go to Siberia and get some good humus from Siberia, untouched by human hands, untouched by pollution or anything. Uh, we got pretty much a lot of that in Anchorage, I mean in Alaska, but I'd like to go to some really remote Siberian location that was just full of humus and, and get it from there. Brilliant. Great answer. Great answer. So do you have any shout outs or comments you'd like to make? Well, you know, I hope everybody uh, uh, certainly talks up as soon as we hang up the uh, the Skype. Um, my books are all available on Amazon. Uh, certainly buy them. My publishers will really appreciate it. I do not make very much money off them. I can tell you that. Um I uh, am uh, Gardener Jeff on Twitter, not very often on it. Instagram, Gardener Jeff. Uh, let's see what else. Jeff at Gardener.com if you want to ask any questions. Uh, if you've got any advising that needs to be done, i got a great team uh, we can send your way. And uh, let's see, I'm going to Dublin in uh, March 3rd and 4th. And then I hope I'm going to be in Australia uh sometime in the first couple of weeks of april maybe we'll set something up sounds exciting sounds exciting so thank you so much again for coming on and for sharing all your knowledge and just in general in broader for all the things you've done for us well it's a lot of fun let's do it again for sure As always, a big thank you to Jeff for taking the time to stop by the show, chat, and share all the great knowledge with us. Big shout out to Seeds Here Now. Radio Ridge Nursery. Organic Gardening Solutions. And the Patreon gang. Love you guys long time. If anyone wants more content, go check out the Patreon. Until next time, my friends. I'll see you.
make it air. If you like it, let me see your hands in the air. If you don't, y'all get the hell out of here. Bass is kicking, drums is drumming. When you hear do this, this, I'm coming. Drums represent the West of London. DT, Piper, into the dragon. 